Okay, so yeah, I'll just kick off. Um, <clears throat> so thanks for the invitation to talk a little bit today about what some work we did a little while back on uh, applying the RDF uh, data cube model we'll in a, order to power yeah. some data exploration uh, dashboards. Hey, Rob! <laughs> Irina needs to kick the thing off first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hello everyone and thanks for coming to this session. So we actually run in two sessions, one after an hour. And the first one is a set of nine lightning talks. So we're basically going to have and control uh, the time very strictly or try to. And then the second session will be um, discussions based on the topics raised in the first presentations. We uh, actually uploaded the link to um, Google Docs to the, sec uh, to the first session um, description. So P please, please, please register your attendance for one or both sessions. And if you wish to put any comments or questions there, that would be appreciated. But with this said, I'll pass now to back to Rob to present on um, his um, work on RDF data cube model. So Rob, it's back to you. Okay, I can get going for real this time. Um, okay, so yeah, as I was saying, it's uh, about applying the RDF data cube model to power data exploration dashboards for the Irish Wave and Weather Boy networks. So a bit of background um, uh, around this. Initially, there's a project called OpenCube, and this was looking at developing software tools to facilitate linked statistical data publishing, and then reusing distributed linked statistical data. So this is more coming from a kind of government statistics approach. Um, and so the motivation for the, for the follow-on project was uh, OpenGov Intelligence, which was funded by the EU uh, Horizon 2020 program, is that public administration publishes open data in an ad hoc manner. Um, and society expects those data-driven public services, not just not access to raw data as such. And so we need to get society involved in how the services are delivered to make sure that we're actually addressing their needs rather than creating a solution to then find a problem. So within this project, they actually put together six different pilots, and they're actually quite diverse if you look at the slides there, ranging from managing government vehicles or business planning through to environmental planning, uh, looking at unemployment, um, real estate, and then the pilot that we were looking at was around um, renewable energy um, resource uh, in Ireland on the West Coast. So we have a, a data boy network uh, of weather boys and then wave boys as well, at a number of sites uh, around on the West Coast. And so what we wanted to do, diving straight in, we wanted to build a data cube around these data in order to serve those data out um, in a more um, sort of high resolution way, or sorry, low resolution at the daily level. So these data come in from the wave weather boys at 60 minute intervals through the day and uh, from the wave boys at 30 minute resolution. So they're available through an a the ERDAP API here at the Marine Institute. Um, what we're doing is we're taking those data uh, using some Python scripts to uh, convert those data into daily statistics, daily statistics, so mean, standard deviation, max and min for the day, um, and then applying those, applying the RDF data cube vocabulary to those, putting them in as RDF, putting them into a Sparkle endpoint, um, and then we're using that to call, we're calling the data from there to do some analytics and provide interactive visualizations. So what I will say is a short talk here. Um, so we have put up on GitHub um, some Jupyter notebooks that break down how this work has been done. Um, uh, and they're also available for those in, uh, who aren't aware that so uh, with Binder, you can go in and you can click on that and you can actually run the Jupyter notebook in the web browser. You don't have to download it and have it all the packages and toolboxes installed. So you can see what it's doing in order to generate that RDF uh, as we go. And then we're linking back to the semantic web 
through the, those data back out to other resources here in Europe under the Sea Data Net program around marine organizations, environmental data sets, observing systems, and then the vocabularies on the NERC vocabulary server, uh, including the CF standard names uh, and other um, vocabularies linking to uh, units and the like. So just to sort of take a, a view, sort of a simplistic view of the data that we're, we're getting in, um, we have a number of station IDs, we're breaking down the statistics, we have data going back to the early 2000s, <clears throat> and then we have a number of parameters which we're generating these data from. Rationale behind generating, generating these data are, are daily uh, on a daily basis is that those data from the 1st of January 2009 don't change in terms of the, the, the statistics you, you generate from them. So although we have the high resolution data there, we want to save time in, in terms of processing them each time somebody makes a request. So within the data cube model, um, we have our dimensions, station ID, statistic and date. And then we have our measures, which are the wave height average, the wave height maximum, the period between the maximum wave height and the period, the average wave period. Uh, we can also mark up the attributes such as the units, and then we're also identifying through down to the observations. So using the, uh, the data cube vocabulary, that's an overview there. I won't dwell on it. The slides are up on uh, the ESIP fig share to take a look, or you can go back to the actual uh, W3C record specification as well. But you can see within that on the sort of top right, you've got dimensions, attributes, and measures as we were talking about, observations, and then also slices. So if you think about how you'd slice through a data cube um, to get to the observations more efficiently. So, the way we started marking those up, you see the, uh, describing the, the dimensions here in the turtle. Um, so you've got the QB uh, prefix, and that indicates those uh, that are coming out of the, um, the data cube vocabulary. So here is a couple of the dimensions, and then you can tag on the ranges and link to other vocabulary con concepts. So you'll see the SDMX, so that's the statistical data metadata exchange. Um, ontology, uh, or, and that's where the data cube originally came from the sort of government statistical data exchange. So when it comes to describing the measurements, you can see here again, so we have the, the wave height average. Uh, it's a property and it's also a measure property through the vocab, uh, through, through the data cube vocabulary. But you can also link, link through to, um, so the RDFSC also there is linking through to the CF standard name, uh, providing the label and then the unit of measure as well, and as well as telling that it's a, it's a decimal value. You can also define, you also have to define the data structure. So not only just the labels, but then how they all relate to each other with regards to the dimensions, the measures, the attributes, and the slices. And then when you talk about the slices, you're describing which of those dimensions are set for a slice, and then you're linking through to each of the observations. And then when you get down to the observation level, uh, for each individual observation, this is the representation of that row that I showed you in the, from, in the, from the Excel spreadsheet earlier. And you can see the dimensions and the measures are linked in there as well. And what we've done is then, that with that in the Sparkle endpoint, we've built our queries. We can change certain aspects within the query, um, depending on the dashboard requirements. And that's then powering this, uh, this dashboard, which you can go and have a play with yourselves at the link at the top there. Um, various different interactive plots allows people to see uh, over the course of the, 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 the deployment uh, over the years, what's the range of measurements that have occurred for a particular day of year um, over that period. And so how does a particular year then sit compared to that max min range or the max min average range? Um, with the climatology or with, within that seasonality, as well as at the same time allowing wave roses and um, energy comparisons. So you can work out what the peak wave period and the peak wave height for a particular site over a period of time are. And that enables uh, wave energy developers to decide, is this site suitable for our devices uh, in terms of getting the optimum efficiency out of them? Or do we need to tweak the device? Or do we need to build a new device? Uh, certainly, one visualization that's proved very popular is uh, being able to visualize what the data availability uh, for a data set is 
and that can be very quickly calculated uh, within the Sparkle query. One thing that we looked at when we're, as, as we were doing this was the, the sort of with RDF and Sparkle, the popularity and the interest. What we can see here quickly from uh, Google Trends is that the interest or in terms of search terms for Sparkle is stayed pretty consistent over time but what you're seeing is there's been a of late there's been a, a much significant increase in interest in MQTT um, in terms of internet of things and data transfer and also GraphQL so GraphQL uh, is something we've done a little bit of work with on top of our ERDAP API and effectively it enables a, a JSON query which gets translated into or through the API and then returns data in a similar format and one thing that the Open Gov Intelligence project was looking at was building this on top of a Sparkle endpoint to take away the complexity of the Sparkle query. And they developed a piece of software called a Java application called uh, Cubicle. It worked very well as you'd expect for the more government statistical data, not so well for the environmental data. Um, and I think that comes about because of the government statistics tends to be one measure per data cube, whereas with the environmental data, you're looking at a, a, a whole host of potential parameters. So we need to work on that. Um, I'll just wrap up here. I'm aware it's running into the last few seconds. So the data cube has actually been, while it, while it was for government statistics originally, the work, there is work that has been done and is ongoing around extending it for spatio-temporal components and also looking at how to represent Earth observation data uh, within that RDF data cube. And I think I'll finish there because I would say that's about my 10 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and just side note, there's a, uh, there's a Google Doc open if you have questions, comments, notes for people and also if you want to get contact information we're recording things in there and it's linked in the session um, page on skin so i will make sylvan the presenter sylvan can we hear you can you talk uh can you hear me when i'm sorry there he is uh you should That's have this perfect screen. You want to go ahead and share yeah tell me when you see that properly we do it's fine okay let's go so 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the focus we've decided on the presentation with my colleague Abdel is to, to try and highlight how linked data helps putting some more glue within our uh, interoperable information system. And I'm going to run an example on our trench groundwater information network. So what we try to get out of the situation is, uh, is that one from PhD Comics. And especially those previous steps are uh, um, maximum this huge amount of years for researchers, domain specialists to search data, try and interpret them, and finally, at the, at the end of their project, manage to extract something and produce new content. Next slide, please. Yep. So the example is this following block diagram. I have our domain experts that is monitoring the nitro geo unit behavior through the use of a piezo meter that is producing groundwater level. And I'm gonna follow that color called blue, red, and green through the end of the presentation. So the current situation is the following, actually. We have many incentives, and especially in Europe with Inspire Directive, to follow that pattern where we have to, the user has to know about the existence of a discovery API, let's say like a catalog service, and then access view service and kind of download for could be WFS or OGC sensor observation service. And the, 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 the long story short is that data is really hidden behind the APIs and the, the user actually needs to discover them and understand how to interact with them. What is really good with all the best practices produced recently about data on the web is that actually what we try to represent on that drawing on the bottom of the of the slide is that data instances like one hydro to unit description for example sits next to the api everything is in the front row and the idea is that everybody should be able to search for those assets be them apis or various feature instances and everything is linked all together um so if we take a resource view of the on the block diagram i displayed before what we actually what our domain expert is interested in is that our hydro geo unit that are monitored by the pedometer and that do which generate observations. And actually what the beauty of dropping in data in this is just using HTTP URI and applying 
assigning HTTP URIs to all those features and linking them all together. That starts to break this silo representation we were uh, describing in the previous slide. So what is also interesting once we've understood that is also that given that data is linked by nature, we will assign those URIs and use, use URIs to link feature instances all together. And the next step is to expose those features, instances, using various representations. Some could be HTML, some could be GML, GML, et cetera. And then I have a bunch of slides that are actually highlighting that. And what we try to have our colleagues doing is that even when they're doing HTML representation of this hydrogen unit, this piezometer, this time series, they still use the URIs, the same URIs, okay? Because they speak about the same uh, real world feature. And we also do the same practice when it comes down to exposing um, those feature description uh, according to Inspire uh, specification and also OGC and um, ISO standards here in GML. And that's an example of what we managed to do with a, a QGIS plugin uh, we've, been, uh, we've been developing here, where actually uh, GIS people can access and add more information in their projects just by the way of using link data, traversing your eyes and adding more content. And we will, you will be able afterwards to see more stuff following the links in the slide. And we're using the same um, principles. We also do that for a GSMLD representation. And this is an example of what has been produced uh, after uh, during OGC LFI uh, interoperability experiment last year. So <clears throat> in all this, uh, the bottom line is that HTTP URI allows us to link all our domain objects that are naturally linked all together. And um, I'm just gonna close the question in the chat, sorry, here. And HTTP URIs are um, also the cornerstone of all those data graphs we're currently um, building because they provide the common access point for a given resource. And then it's up for the client to content negotiate and uh, do more just choose cho choices uh, whether it is interested in HTML or various representations. Then, let's go to what I was saying. You can, uh, we set up various inform information systems and applying uh, your eyes and best practices and uh, choosing various representations. And then it's up for the various clients. Clients could be broader, it could be uh, desktop, it could be various machine stuff. And then it's up for the, the library to decide what's, what's used best. I have another non-geo example <clears throat> that is really worth uh, mentioning. Is we also, there is a, a trend in Europe, and it's kind of linked to the Inspire dynamics around the setting up register for vocabulary, let's say, code list. And we try to induce um, a lot of our uh, domain colleagues to, to actually describe their control vocab. Code list, uh, also applying uh, link data uh, best practices, and then they end up having URIs for each register, register item, and of course, uh, this is consumed by the feature description. That's kind of everything is progressively being told together. So, <clears throat> back to the initial uh, issue how, how do we see getting out of that situation? Um, for data to be Discoverable, of course, we need to assign them HTTP URIs. Discovery could be through uh, interoperable, interoperable APIs or and also mainstream search engine. And also, also you can discover uh, feature instances because you actually have incoming HTTP URIs to them, like a piezometer pointing to its, the aquifer it's monitoring. That really helps uh, domain colleagues. Then when it comes to the second image, uh, applying semantic web and link data uh, practices, uh, allows them to have self-descriptive data that helps a lot when it comes down to understanding the, the data sets you actually retrieve or the data instance you actually retrieve through the HTTP URI. And then for the, the last slide, um, given that we try and expose more and more data using ontologies, and all, we kind of pave the road toward using reasoning. And yes, it also um, link data where uh, library uh, really helps also setting up uh, kind of nice uh, data visualization techniques as well. So what next? 
I have to answer to the question. There is a down-to-earth view on that question. Um, what we really want to achieve is, with my, my colleagues here is, um, yeah, we try to, do, you wrote that sentence in, in this way, bring all this from a you know, hipster uh, practice to mainstream practices. And we really feel that all we need is in, already in the existing data silos, but these are silos. And all we need to break the silos is just applying link data as much as we can to maximize data discovery and reuse and really create uh, this data graph we're speaking about. And this will have a tremendous data impact. And it's not, it's just about rich, not so hard to set up in a way, just a matter of, uh, of way, I would say. And otherwise, if we don't do that, uh, we will continue playing in our playgrounds and doing nice data, uh, link data uh, demo. But our mainstream IT and GIS colleagues will continue setting up their isolated data silos not linking uh, features all together on a, that's, that's too bad <clears throat> the other way to answer the what next question is a kind of research and development uh, technology readiness uh, level view and that some elements in all this need to become more mature so in the lc line of projects lc we're working on link data architecture kind of setting up what we call a uh, Link data gazetteer system, that's kind of pretty nice. There is much more to do on um, what we call the URI probing. Is actually, yeah, you have a URI, but you want to know what's available behind and uh, in kind of a machine to machine way. Selfie is proposing a pattern. There is work on content negotiation by profile that needs to be reconciled as well. We, third bullet, so we wish to have more semantics in the recent OGC API. And we wish we could have more link data and semantic integration in mainstream uh, geographic or non-geographic gene bracket uh, the IES client. So that's really comes mainstream for my domain colleagues next door. And, and it's not just a, an IT, a bunch of IT gigs playing all together. So you know GCAPI and mainstream clients, but also others like Jupyter Notebook and others. And I'm seeing I'm done with my presentation. Thank you, Sylvan. That was great. Um, Boyan, do we have your audio? Yeah, you have my audio. Are you going to drive, Dave? I just made you presenter so you can do your screen if you like. I, I don't mind if you... Sorry, did you make me presenter? I did. Can you see my presentation? No, uh, there we go. We got you, go ahead. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks Dave for the invitation and Irina. Uh, this is going to very much complement what Sylvain just presented, uh, taking the domain uh, outside groundwater to water in general. And uh, it is not moving my screen forward. Interesting. Uh, do people see the second slide now? Uh, hello, have I lost contact? Yeah, we, do. we see your PowerPoint, but that's probably okay. Uh, do you see the second slide? Because I wasn't able to move it forward. Yeah, by end. Yeah, we, see yeah, yeah. we can see it. Okay, sorry. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a pilot project we're discussing between uh, uh, various government agencies in Canada and the U.S. to try and see if we can link water data of all kinds uh, within the country and between countries. Uh, and we're into the second or third year, depending on which agency you're speaking from, of this project uh, uh, in the final year. And uh, there's a number of people involved, uh, but primarily uh, Natural Resources Canada, Environment Canada, and the USGS. The motivation for this uh, the motivation for this is of course is that the water cycle is complex. Uh, data is held by many different water people, but uh, a lot of the problems that we have to deal today within the water cycle require an integrated view of water that uh, uh, combines atmospheric, groundwater, and surface water components together for a unified view. 
Uh, that's obviously uh, a significant interoperability problem. Uh, and we're using, uh, we're looking at using linked data to go to the next level of interoperability. The problem that we're facing right now is that current technologies largely allow us to dig into data sets uh, uh, quite efficiently and elegantly, but there's an issue with being able to link data across data sets. So we can, uh, for example, be able to extract uh, aquifers and wells from a groundwater database, uh, rivers and watersheds from a surface water database, uh, gauges for surface water and atmospheric water from other databases. But in order to know how these are connected, it would require a deep look into the literature and possibly some geospatial analysis. Uh, so the next step then would be to uh, be able to say how these things are actually linked one to the other. So for instance, a particular aquifer uh, is intersected by a well, uh, crosses a river, uh, has a particular gauge on it, which would be very useful for water scientists. So the approach is to look at linked data uh, as part of the larger semantic web, which is currently emerging. And as we, most of us know, I suspect, the link, the semantic web and linked data model is really uh, uh, an extension of the web in a sense. Um, the web, we were largely looking at linking documents. Um, but with the linked data and semantic web model, it's not just about linking documents, but it's about uh, separating the notion of representations from the things that are being represented. Uh, and any of those can be represented by URLs. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite an interesting and, and important uh, distinction because it also means that anything can be represented by a URL. Uh, and that includes abstract things like concepts or ontologies, as well as more concrete things, uh, anything else that exists, more or less. So that led us with GSIP into the understanding that there are at least four types of URLs that we have to deal with uh, in different contexts. So there's the URL for a particular thing then there might be a URL for metadata about that thing, including where all its different representations are. And representations are not simply RDF representations. In this case, they're any kind of representation. It could be a map, it could be a PDF document, it could be Word file, it could be uh, a data document, such as an RDF, XML, or JSON document. Um, so the metadata URL would allow us to know where all these things are and allow us to navigate to a particular data URL. Uh, and there are two types of data URLs that we're recognizing within the system right now. Um, one that are persistent uh, and meant to exist within a community and uh, persist over time, and others that are local to particular data providers that could potentially change over time. Uh, and then the implementation of these different URLs can vary depending on particular types of architectures. So for instance, in a peer-to-peer -peer environment where largely a local data provider knows nothing about the community that they're in or very little and has a few links outside, they would simply resolve uh, an ID to their local URL. Uh, but in a much more integrated community, it might be useful to know where all the resources are for a particular thing and then be able to navigate through both uh, persistent and transient URLs to finally get to the data. Um, so we can see this as two end members really as peer-to-peer -peer and community-based architectures in terms of where URLs are resolved and where data lives. Uh, and what we're experimenting with in this project is a hybrid architecture at the moment where um, you know, Canada and the US are seen as nodes that uh, know about each other, uh, but may be actually uh, consisting of uh, communities within their respective parts. Uh, in order to do this, we, we had to use existing ontology frameworks to be able to describe these documents returned, particularly for uh, the information metadata piece for each one of these to allow them to be described, but also to be harvested so the data provider can just stand up one of those pieces and find them. And we're still in the process right now of being able to test this. Architecturally, what this looks like is, yep, 
architecturally what this looks like is uh, essentially the ability to provide a URL broker, any place where we have uh, one of those nodes, and uh, a repository for linkages, as well as the individual data streams, as one might expect. And what that has led to us is a current uh, pilot working prototype where we can say things like the Lake Champlain water uh, shed in the US is the lower catchment for the Richelieu Riviere Little River watershed in Canada and the north uh, uh, through being able to link the, uh, uh, the features across them. And what you're seeing on screen is the metadata page or the info page with the info URL that uh, gets redirected to or resolved from the IDs. And what that uh, briefly shows is that we're trying to use uh, linked data approaches to be able to connect uh, many different kinds of data providers of water uh, within countries and across countries uh, in this pilot project. And we've got a demo and the, the websites I showed you in the slide before are actually online. You could actually Google for some of those things and be able to find them and navigate your way through. Uh, and finally, just like to thank uh, uh, a lot of the uh, or people involved in this. Uh, most of them are captured in this slide, and possibly not all uh, from the various organizations. And just to repeat, this is a pilot project. It's an experiment in trying to link things, but I think thus far it's been uh, relatively successful. But we still have uh, several months to go in the pilot project. Uh, I don't know, Dave, if you wanted to add anything to that. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. It's been a fun project. Um, and and yeah, if you want to learn more, we can talk offline and, and um, can look Boyan up um, as well. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Dahlia. Um, Dahlia, if, if your game will give you the screen here, if I can figure out how to work this computer, make presenter. Are you um, okay with that or should I go ahead and drive? If you, if you would, that would be better. Thanks. Oh, okay. We can do that. I got set up that way from the beginning, so... Yeah, that's all good. Oh, that's in this. Here, let's do use slideshow. Ah, perfect. I see it well. Well, we okay. well, now we're hold hold on just a second. Oh no, now we're good. Right. Uh, we could yeah, we could skip that first slide if you want. Um, except that it gives credits to my team. Uh, can you hear me okay, everybody? Yeah. Okay, super. Um, hello, this project is about integrating linked open topographic data from the national map of the US Geological Survey. The national map is the 21st century version of the uh, national topographic mapping program in the United States. And our project, called the Map is Knowledge Base, is a prototype system built on objectives and approaches for cross-thematic topographic data integration based on semantic technology. So next, please. Uh, Location-related URIs typically have a larger percentage of a linked open data network than do other data themes. Our system for topographic data co-referencing, querying, retrieval, and visualization is designed uh, to be based on spatial data science. So the user interface, for, uh, it, 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 hypothetically, the user interface enables information retrieval through a browsable graph approach, uh, an interactive map uh, visualization um, uh, that's uh, it can initially be retrieved where the data can initially be retrieved using Sparkle or GeoSparkle type queries, other topological relations as well, and so that a user could click on a feature on the interactive map, and then that click would retrieve related, relevant data linked to the selected feature or set of features. Um, then map, the map updates to build kind of a linked data scene or landscape. Uh, the system transforms multi-source data into RDF format and links via URLs. 
next slide, please. The, our data are organized as summaries, um, as in patterns and, and shapes. Uh, and that is because all URIs could be dereferenced in linked data consumption, but only part of the descriptions would be aggregated. Uh, for example, if set of URIs interconnected by same as, or a seed URI and the URIs that are transitively linked to it. Next, please. <clears throat> The reason we want to focus on summaries is that research has shown that even if two URIs are correctly linked by OWL same as and refer to the same thing, the use of same as and linked open data may conflate context dependent descriptions that are provided in different data sources through in, and, and they would uh, conflate those through inference. So the results may be only partial equivalence or may even have introduced errors. So same as triple descriptions often should not be simply aggregated by merging graphs. Next, please. Our ontology files of different topographic data themes, such as hydro or structures or transportation, uh, primary, right now we're working mostly with vector data, are modules with their own subgraphs. So only a few key resources that contribute a lot of informational triples form the basic ontology pattern. The ontology pattern that repeats for each module has a gazetteer type framework combined with a GeoSparkle feature geometry ontology. The graph for each theme differs by the subtypes of feature classes. Next, please. Our approach further interlinks various feature types, such as the one shown on the right, that are associated by nearness. The result approximates the basic concept of topographic maps, high and medium resolution data, such as are found on US topos. Next, please. The system accepts multiple data formats through GeoServer that can integrate with data from the national map. So different data sources are initially listed in drop-down menu or by clicking on a query called More Information. Um, you can barely see that. Uh, uh, once uh, the feature, once somebody clicks on on a feature, you know, then you can see all the related uh, properties, uh, any literal values, or um, object classes. The user interface displays results using various visualization methods such as tables, maps, concept maps, or annotation. So the next one, please. A particular problem when integrating linked open data with GIS is that geospatial features are, uh, are organized to be represented as geometries in GIS. So their ontological classification is uh, normally stored in a table. Um, uh, in our case, for large databases such as the USGS, they have codes that are assigned to categories with complex natural language semantic descriptions. The problem with that, although the, the natural language descriptions are very rich, uh, they can't be queried. Uh, you know, they're, they're just fields in a table. So next, please. So one, so one characteristic of our ontology pattern is to integrate coordinate geometries, feature codes, and ontology feature type classes through inference. So this facilitates uh, data conversion processes as well as helps in the queries. Um, there may be users who are completely familiar with F codes. Uh, other users really think more cognitively. So. Uh, we try to reach out both to legacy users and new users. So the ontology allows certain feature types to be associated with specific geometry types, yet preserves those codes. Next, please. And this is my summary slide. Uh, to summarize, the MAPIS knowledge based prototype of the U.S. Geological Survey draws on commonly used GIS and other formats to link data across themes into patterns of complex feature type semantics. The interactive user interface allows browsable graph and other visualization methods such as concept, ma concept maps for exploring geographic information at topographic scales. 
And so thank you. Uh, for more information, please visit our website. That's all. Great. Thank you very much. Um, if you don't mind dropping a link to the webpage um, where you can get more information to the Google Doc, that would be that'd be great. Okay. All right. Let me go. You are that one, right? All right. Next up, we have Alistair Ritchie, and. Oh, well, they, they see this in on the online, so we need to do you slide, you slideshow. I'll flag you with a couple okay. minutes if that's cool. That's fine. <laughs> so hi, I'm Alistair. I'm from New Zealand, and I'm really sorry about the accent. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm lowering you into them because this is the Antipodean section from now on. So see the New Zealand or Australian accents. Right, so I'm going to talk... Normally, I'm talking about what we're doing um, with with data at um, Landcare Research in New Zealand, which is a government research institute. Um, but really, this is about the Alfie and Selfie projects that have um, been mentioned uh, a few times in previous presentations. So there'll be a bit of context from our organisa um, organisational perspective, a bit of history, kind of why we're doing the Alfie Selfie thing and this journey to, towards um, structured data on the web. And then there'll be some random musings, so random, I'm not even sure what I'm going to say yet, so I'm looking forward to finding out as well. Right, one of my main roles um, at Landcare Research is managing um, soil profile data, and we want to get that into a distributed uh, data set, so outside, you know, sharing it with um, partners outside the organisation. The, the point of that great, um, picture on the edge is just to show that it's, it's a complex data set. That's a fraction of actually what's available for a given soil profile in our database. And as more and more techniques are coming on board, the data that are held against these um, sampling artifacts are becoming more and more complicated. So we're working to share these and we're involved in various initiatives. The useful one here is, um, uh, is in the context of the Open Geospatial Consortium. We did a soil data interoperability experiment to come up with standards for the delivery of soil data. And we um, use the, the, the OGC um, infrastructure, the service, um, the service protocols to deliver those data with a few add-ons. And we used, uh, uh, was it, um, uh, standardized information modeling to govern content and that sort of thing. And we succeeded. In about six months, we got um, sampling data hosted in the Netherlands, Australia, and New Zealand uh, delivered into a uh, into a centralised environment, and we were able to, you know, write one tool to um, process and present data across across the board. However, there's a dark and terrible secret um, to this to this infrastructure. It's built on XML. Um, but do note, actually, just for future reference, that there's a lot of links in there already. Even though we're not not, not strictly speaking in uh, in the linked data world, it's always been really useful to actually have. Uh, Enduring URIs for things to help um, hook our data together in a distributed environment. So there's always been, over the last decade or so, for, for, for us anyway, a kind of dilemma about how we do, go about doing our um, environmental data interoperability. We've achieved it often. There's a couple of the, um, examples up there of projects that I've been involved in. But ultimately, it's not ever been as widely adopted as we would like. And you can roughly um, say this is because it's hard to find our data and services. Find, try to find them on, in a Google search on the web. And there are unusual data access um, protocols and formats. Um, so people find it quite hard to actually interact with our services when they get to them. But we can't throw this complexity away. We need it. It's there for a reason. It's not a conceit. Um, and if we simplify things, that often results in catastrophic information or capability loss. So we've got a challenge. And I'll put the context here, too, that this is a challenge for those of us that are um, uh, exposing complex data repositories. So we need to provide this rich capability, but we also have to support search engines and web developers. So we need a suite of APIs available that support these communities. And these need to provide data in concert with others. So not just us, but also government agencies in New Zealand or um, researchers overseas. And we've got to describe the whole environment. We're not, living in a, we're not living in a silo. Soil is a function of the environment. It influences other parts of the environment. We have a data aggregation, aggregation um, problem. So enter Alfi, which is the environmental linked feature interoperability experiment. That's why we call it Alfi. It's hard to say. And Selfie, which is second Alfi, 
a great a great poem, which is proof if you need it that the OGC really needs a girlfriend. So it's focused on um, both of these initiatives are focused on web friendly Westfall data discovery um, and and publication or introduction to to our services. But we, uh, under no circumstances, throwing away the discipline that we gain from uh, linked data practices, but also decades of effort to actually come up with really good domain models for describing the environment. Alfie kicked off its origins were in spatial data on the web best practices, which were a sort of a, um, a global recognition within the IGC that we actually needed to bring ourselves closer to the web. And there were a few um, practices they recommended that we ran with. Number one was around using IDs um, to identify and link things. Let's actually meet the developers where, the, where they live in terms of using encodings and formats that match, the, uh, match their needs. Let's keep it simple by um, hiding some complexity behind um, some convenience APIs and make your stuff ex um, indexable by search engines. And we've worked around doing that. So, you know, we've given things enduring uh, URIs and we're, we're benefiting from the work of the you know, W3C community, the Range 14 decision and that kind of thing, which you can look up yourself if you're sleepy uh, or not sleepy. Um, use the encodings that the um, that our target audience of like link data hipsters, Sylvan, that was quite cool. So web hipsters, they like JSON. Um, use appropriate relation types to link things. That's actually where some of the cool stuff that we've been doing comes in. We have great models that help us link stuff. Convenience APIs. Well, actually, having a URI for thing is a really nice, convenient um, alternative to a service call. And using HTML and schema.org, we can make our stuff uh, searchable. So those are the um, links to the two uh, projects. I encourage you to go to look at those in detail. Um, Alfie kicked, off, kicked us off by working out how to do the schema.org stuff for indexing our content. And we also settled on using JSON-LD as a default encoding for our data. It allows us to provide semantic rigor. It lets us bind us through context into the, um, uh, the ontologies that we've already built, but it's also consistent with schema.org. So we've got this nice, tightly um, uh, coupled way of uh, presenting the data. Selfie took it a wee bit further. We started looking at what happens when you actually dereference a URI for a first time. What's this landing page like? How do we how do we actually start to link into our distributed web of data? There are descriptions available um, held by other parties um, or actually held in other systems. How do we link into something that's, say, served by WFS? And we're um, working closely with the AGC to actually bring the uh, models that we need into our and so on. So the musing, the thing that's on my mind at the moment actually is, is so Alfie tries to be really simple, but in the classical model, no simpler, right? Our, the formalism is important, like I've said, we love it. But it's been really interesting talking to people about um, after Alfie, for amongst a lot of the, uh, the, the, the techies, the reaction was, so what? And this deeply hurt me, and I, 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 I don't mind admitting that I possibly cried, but on reflection, it's actually a good thing. Right, we're succeeding. It's just, of course, it's working. And what resulted from that was we, in, we, we found that talking to people about their data in the context of Alfie got people unreasonably excited with huge expectations of what we could do with stuff. Oh, great, we can pull all this together and start to, to model when bridges are going to be taken out by catastrophic floods from, uh, from rainfall events that are happening um, in the mountains miles away. Now, arguably, a lot of this stuff can be done already. Um, but these conversations are having, people are focusing on using our data with our services um, this way because they're no longer bewildered by what we're, what we're telling them how our data works. It's like, here's a URI, dereference it. The response that you get, you can work with in libraries and your day-to-day -day toolkit for handling web data. That's, uh, that's hugely powerful. And what we're finding across the Alfie thing is this is the biggest value. Um, of the project. It's around that discovery and first contact with our systems. And the first contact thing is important. So you've seen Boyan and Sylvan, and that um, demonstrates some really, really cool advanced um, systems out there. They're important. We're not saying we're replacing them. What we're doing is actually what we joked about in the early days of the project, calling it a gateway drug to get people hooked into the data, and then they can start using the more advanced um, stuff, both in the linked data world, but also in, say, the APIs implementations of the APIs defined by the OGC and so on. So from our perspective, we quite, two minutes? Cool, I'm never ahead of time. Um, sorry, you did? Dude, all right, I just wasted them. But um, 
<laughs> so our plan, we want to get these basics done, and I, I got to labour that point a wee bit because we spend a lot of time doing the advanced systems and we actually forget to get the, the basic organisation stuff sorted first. So get this done. People will have a valuable entry point into our, um, into our data resources. We hope that this implementation is a pattern that we can apply across all our data resources, perhaps even things that are not, not applicable to, um, you know, directly to the physical environment. Then, once this is tied off, we want to get back onto doing the um, more advanced work because, like I said before, the decades of conceptual and technical excellence um, that is that has led into this that we want to see realised on the modern web. And yeah, repeating, you know, labouring a point now, we think Alfie will actually be the starting point for getting there. Done. We're on time. Thank you so much, all the speakers, for being on time here. This, which one? That one. Let's make sure this does that. All right. Um, yes. Hello, so my name is Irina Bastrakova. I'm a director of special data architecture in Geoscience Australia. And today I'm talking about um, our collaborative project, which is called Location Integration Project, or LOKI. And this is sort of two-part presentation. I'm going to give a general overview of the project. And Jonathan, who is presenting after me, will be talking more in details about technical framework and our current implementations. So location index, um, the aim is integration of data through geography. And our vision is that anyone can access data everywhere at any time. And it is a part of quite large investment of Australian government, which is data integration partnership for Australia. And the aim of this um, program is to maximize the user value of government data. And we have a couple of goals. So we aim into uh, create new insights into complex uh, policy questions through data integration and analysis, and also to support well-informed decisions across multiple agencies. So the um, result which we are trying to achieve is to create a consistent way for seamless integration of data on people, business, and the environment to solve cross-portfolio uh, policy problems. And now partners at the moment are Australian Bureau of Statistics, Department of Environment and Energy, Department of Agriculture, Geoscience Australia, and CSIRO. And the project itself is two year in duration, so we are in the second half of the second year. So what are the major outputs? So uh, different organizations uh, and departments looking after different bits of, um, of the data. And quite commonly, they uh, look at them from their own perspective. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to connect uh, economic, environmental, and social data coming from those departments. We would like to establish links between spatial and non-spatial data. So basically, we're trying to build GIS without using GIS tools. We would like to support uh, cross-domain data analysis and demonstrate use of the location intelligence. We're also testing and applying modern technologies such as linked data and discrete global grid systems. And currently we're looking at integration of um, a number of different data sets, which you can see on screen. So what are, is our challenge? So we're trying to bring together data which um, has multiple geographies and observations, but they are not structured in the same way. So we are dealing with vector data, we are dealing with raster data, we are dealing with multiple uh, types of tabular data. And in some uh, tabular data, it could be described as um, latitude and uh, longitude. Sometimes it's artificially created um, location information or aggregations, like for example, statistical boundaries could be indication of area. And sometimes it's just descriptive geom uh, geography without any coordinate whatsoever. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to bring all of it together. 
So we have three major challenges. So the first challenge is our data integration. And the major goal is semantic integration of linked data. And we would like to see our data accessible and fair, but not delivered and downloadable, which is a common way of um, using the data at the moment. So through, well, principle of the linked data, such as uh, applying persistent identifiers, making itself describable for metadata, using a standardized protocol, non-license, um, indexed on the web. We are trying to improve machine-to-machine -machine communication and discoverability of this data. We are implementing consistent ways of data analysis and mining, and also trying to improve uh, uptake of our data beyond our traditional clients and use cases. So basically publishing it on the web, we are encouraging global communities to start using and integrating their data with our data together. So what have we done so far? We are already created relationships for each and between different data sets. So we created ontology for location index and for each individual data set. We also uh, encourage integration by implementation of common classification and vocabulary tags. We also registering our um, uh, data sets through, uh, on, on the web through the set of registries and landing pages and creating uh, pre-calculated indexes which can improve in uh, speed analysis and data mining. Our second challenge is uh, testing innovative technologies such as linked data and discrete global grid systems. And the goal is to create extendable systems which we can reuse. So we would like to build new capabilities across multiple agencies, implement set of new tools, but also encourage reuse of existing tools like Research Data Voc uh, Vocabularies Australia. So our system will be highly scalable, highly secure, repeatable and easy to administer and also flexible. And so far, we created a um, linked data database, like graph database. We are working on implementation of the DGS engine, which is math-based algorithms and agnostic to projection and data formats. We're also implementing a number of GUIs, and Jonathan is going to talk about those and number of APIs uh, for generic and specific access to data. So our challenge is multidisciplinary environments and multiple agencies. So we really need to look at how we can simplify implementation and uptake of those systems within those agencies. And our third challenge is the social architecture. And the goal is to create systems with user-centric approach but also through that project and product processes improve overall governance of our data and systems we are building. So the target is to have improved user experience and efficiency, human related processes, institutional culture and availability of skilled experts. So for that, we need to better understand what are the ethical and privacy and security problems different organizations may face because especially because we are dealing with uh, human data and privacy and ethics is quite important for a number of organizations. So we are improving integration workflows. We're also um, building our systems based on archetypes. Quite significant piece of work was done on um, interviewing multiple clients uh, with, which are performing different functions and create a set of archetypes so our APIs and GUIs actually would be of value to them. And training and upskilling is a quite a big issue because there are not a lot of um, people in Australia with relevant technical skills, but it's also what we're trying to improve is understanding of how to manage data, what are requirements for vocabularies, data stewards, et cetera, uh, for people who are actually dealing with data and creating those data sets within those organizations. So we're looking at functional governance and um, for ensuring stability of funding and procedures. We're looking at technical governance, looking after, after different technical components, not just within our partners, uh, partner group, but across uh, government. 
And we're also looking at streamlining processes. So at the moment, uh, the processes is look like a spaghetti ball. So it's very inconsistent and um, no one knows how it's been implemented. So we are trying to streamline it through location index. And this is just an example of uh, one of the implementations we've done. So it's implemented. This uh, is an example of implementation of bringing together raster uh, imagery, satellite imagery, and vector data for water observations. And uh, we are bringing this way link data, linking little data to big data or long tail data to uh, satellite imagery through the GGS indexing, and um, how the GS worked basically enabled us to significantly reduce timing of connecting attribution with uh, raster data. And our example is basically we were going to achieve what we previously were doing within months, within days. We can repeat this process because we recorded uh, that uh, workflow we don't need to build a complex GIS system and we uh, can implement consistent answer to many questions. And in summary, uh, we are unlocking data potential. So we are enabling machine to machine data integration and analysis and remove needs for cross agency data transfer, which currently take probably about 30% of people's time and trying to bring data together. We accelerated innovation for developing new tools and protocols and also testing new technologies. And also, also maximizing collaboration between different groups. And it's not just for government, we're also uh, talking to research and industry and developing common govern pro governance processes and workflows across those. Excellent, thank you. And continuing the Location index theme. Oh, I guess we need to go get your slides from here. Oh, last minute edition. Is that right? Okay. All right, thank you. Take it away. Okay, hello, my name is Jonathan uh, from CSIRO Australia. Um, I'm a data scientist and I've been working, um, our team's been working on the Loki project as well, as Serena mentioned, um, just acknowledging some of the um, key people from CSIRO and GA who've been involved uh, intimately in the project. Um, I'm here to follow up on the presentation Irina talked about. And basically our team's been involved in trying to understand how we spin up a spatial knowledge graph, which I'll explain. And in theory, that should be easy. And um, I guess this is kind of the contention for this uh, pr uh, presentation, so I won't give it away yet. But um, what I'm going to be talking about is skimming through a bit of the Loki and problem space um, stuff that Irina mentioned and diving into what I'm calling a spatial knowledge graph. I'm not sure if anyone's coined that term before, but um, just describing what we've been doing and reflecting on what was easy and what was not so easy and possibly not solved yet. Um, so, Irina mentioned that the key goal of Loki is to enable streamlined um, location-based integration. Um, so, a question, key question that we're trying to answer is, how do we actually um, enable data interoperability between one geography? You might have a geography defining statistical boundaries uh, for like census type stuff, um, with other geographies like environmental um, boundaries. Uh, like water catchments, for example. So here's an example I've got um, on the first uh, thing on the left here is what we call a statistical area level two, which is a census district. And it happens to be in Canberra. Okay, so this is Canberra region there. Um, we use it to collect population data and other things. Um, you know, tell me, tell me the things that are within it defined in its geography. And this is the next level down, which is called statistical, uh, statistical level, statistical area level two, SA2. Um, but also we've got things like street localities and an environmental feature here, which is a hydrological feature from uh, the Bureau of Meteorology. So 
traditionally what you do is you, you use GIS to map all that stuff. But what we're trying to do is pre-calculate all those relationships and encode that in a way that we can traverse using knowledge graphs. So what we can do then is take data like this, population count um, from a census, which is on the left, and reinterpret that and understand population using hydrological catchments. So if you give this to a water manager, they suddenly can understand, ah, in my water catchment, there are these many people impacted by you know, things that are happening uh, from the environment. Um, as, I'm, as Irina alluded to, the current process currently looks like this. You've got analysts and they've got to navigate through all these data um, products, trying to have to integrate everything and then munge it together and analysis happens. And so the idea is that we have data uh, ingested, identified, um, tagged with the right things, um, have the links uh, between those identifiers uh, well sorted, and so the analyst can then access the features, um, traverse, um, transform things using tools, and then redo that if they need to um, consistently. So what we need to do, um, build to do that, is basically get our spatial data sets. They come in all sorts, like shape files, geo packages, web feature services. Um, uh, take the links between those geographies. We call them link sets. Uh, I heard Boyan earlier have um, presented on a link data set database, which is kind of a similar concept. And we put them online with um, strong identity, um, and I'll explain what that is soon, um, having human and machine readable views. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, the items, the things, right? But then we need useful APIs to actually process and do things with it. And so um, we need those as well. So the Loki technical approach um, is to firstly publish spatial data using reliable and consistent web identifiers, um, a la the spatial data working group's best practices. Um, and you can see that particular region that I mentioned earlier, um, an example of that giving uh, strongly, uh, strong web identifiers here. So you dereference this, you get a landing page, you can get other stuff about it. Um, we create and govern links between the spatial features. So we have a method for generating those link sets. So things like, you know, um, this region is within this region using GeoSparkle. Um, those link sets are, or the method itself is um, something that we're trying to make governed and consistent. And as I mentioned earlier, providing human, providing access via human and machine readable views, um, and then APIs. Um, so how do we actually spatial, semantically enable spatial data? So what we do um, in Loki is, um, this is an example of a data set. So we take the spatial data set, um, we transform it, we annotate it um, using an ontology for that particular data set. In this case, this is the statistical areas uh, data set that I mentioned earlier, um, which has been defined by our project, but aligned with uh, well-known ontologies. Um, and so you can start to define the graph of things like, you know, this was a statistical area, it's within this state, I think it's ACT, and you can get more information about that um, based off this graph that you're building. Um, this is the link data um, landing page. So you get the landing page, um, and then you can get a, a, a total view, uh, RDF total view, which is the equivalent information, but it's all hinging off this link data URI. Um, we've been prototyping something called a geometry data service. So it takes um, the geometries that come with the features, but separates it and gives it, gives it its own identifier. Um, so we're trying to decouple the idea of a feature and the geometry. Um, so this is something that we're prototyping. So similar thing, you get a URI for the geometry um, you can dereference it and content negotiate and ask for a RDF total view or a GeoJSON view or a WKT view or text plane view, which gives you WKT. Um, and that's something that other researchers, um, uh, Blake and others have been looking at um, proposing in their work. So we've just been prototyping this um, over the past couple of months. Two minutes, okay. So I mentioned 
um, online access to spatial features with strong identity and web APIs. And so really that's our architecture at this, at this point. So everything that we have, all the spatial data sets, they're linked data APIs for them and they get ingested in what's traditionally referred to as a knowledge graph or knowledge base um, in this Loki graph cache, which we are standing up. Um, and extending the idea of a knowledge graph being just a knowledge graph RDF triple store, graph store with a Sparkle endpoint, um, we've included other um, optimized databases for different questions. So we wanted to do uh, traditional search engine kind of stuff, text, text search. Um, we feel that RDF triple stores can do it, but they're not optimized for the sorts of queries that say Elasticsearch might give you. So we've got a text search engine and RESTful APIs on top of that. And for spatial queries, we've also got a geodatabase that we've started um, prototyping um, integration with this graph cache, which answers the geometry kind of stuff. Um, so this is kind of our hybrid spatial knowledge graph. Um, I'll skip these because I'm running out of time. Um, but the question I started earlier, building this is really easy, right? Um, the short answer is yes and no. Um, at the start of the, when I came on the project, I, we really didn't know what questions we wanted this graph to answer. And, and the direction that we were going was, it's gonna answer everything. So we'll build a system that will answer everything. Um, all you need to do is put everything in a graph store and let people query whatever they want. Um, but we reeled that back a little bit and started talking about what the users are gonna do with it and, and started um, building up from there. So I guess the, the no bit is that once you know what you wanna answer and how to represent the data and you can start building the APIs for that. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say one thing. Don't just turn on reasoning because this is what, basically this is what, what we, we, we felt like. It's like, we've got a billion triples, let's just turn on reasoning and everything's gonna work. It doesn't, um, yeah, so just beware. And trying to get web developers to write Sparkle is like this, you know? You think it's, I'm a linked data hipster, so I think everyone could, should write Sparkle. But um, web developers, you know, they don't, they don't write Sparkle. So um, keep them as users in mind as well. Um, just some takeaways, knowledge graphs are great, but it's not a silver bullet, um, and I've mentioned why. Um, we wanted to cover optimizing those queries that knowledge graphs can answer, as well as stuff that other engines answer well. So, and yeah, don't just turn on reasoning. Um, thank you. I've got a poster, so if you want to you know, talk later, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to be around for the next session if you want to learn more. Sure, thank you. This is another one I need to get from here. All right, another semi-related talk from Will Francis. There you are, go ahead, take it away. Hi, my name is Will Francis. I'm from Geoscience Australia. I'll, I'll be covering some similar themes, I guess, and so I might skip a few few parts of the slides that, that have been covered in, in good detail already. Um, looking at some of the organisational realities of supporting linked data, supporting persistent identifiers at the feature level over time, not just for the first time you, you, you mint them. Um, some of the tools we use and, and the, the processes that support that. Um, at, at Geoscience Australia, we, we have many different science domains, including the location index, um, place names, uh, use case that are arena presented. Um, we also have geological data, and we have, in, you can see in this graph, a lot of a lot of different types of relationships. And so we need to uh, disambiguate what is a uh, entity to entity relationship, what is a representation of the same entity, um, and what is just an associated resource in some cases. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, you know, 
uh, it actually takes a, a bit of infrastructure to make these things work under the hood. We need uh, tools like the PID service, which is uh, a tool that lets you register different uh, different uh, identity resolution patterns and record uh, which part of the organization requested that pattern and so that you can ensure that there's no conflicts. Um, you can see here in, in this architectural overview, we, we start with the, the identifier and, and we you know, use those in different data sets or different data objects. We deliver services um, and and then we provide APIs to those services and eventually um, through the redirection deliver different representations. Um, but one of the, the new tools that we've been using is, is the Python Linked Data API uh, tool, um, which I'll look at briefly, um, and uh, how that helps with the content negotiation component. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, we're, we're a big organization, we have many different databases, we have many internal identifiers and, and we need to evolve those into persistent identifiers on the web so that there's a necessary process to do uh, a, a, what we have here is the public data model ontology where we try to uh, reconceptualize some of the, the themes of data and the, and the different relationships between representations and apply identifier schemes that, that can be truly persistent that can handle change over time. Uh, yeah, so, so in the, into the tooling side, the Pi, Pi LD API is a tool we're, we're using and, and it's underpinning some of the work in Location Index as, as Jonathan presented. It's, it's a Python module, it's a small tool in the RDF lib uh, uh, Python suite um, that supports uh, publishing different views of, of an entity. It hooks up to a data source and allows you to uses, um, uh, you know, Flask is the deployment environment and, um, and uh, sorry, uh, Ginger Templates uh, is, is the, the engine that, that processes defined set of uh, views that, that you encode in those templates. So it's a, uh, it's a very lightweight tool and it's highly customizable, which, which is a good thing uh, in terms of uh, meeting user needs, but it's also a challenging thing in, in that you need to actually do the customization. Uh, so here's an example of a, a data source. It's hooking, it's consuming a web feature service. And in other cases, we consume uh, direct database connections. So the, the publishing component, the web request uh, comes through and what PyLD API is doing is it's uh, on, on demand, creating RDF on the fly, essentially. It's, it's reading into the data source. It's using the template to construct uh, the requested view and delivering that view on the web. Uh, there's a, a new uh, proposed uh, standard, I guess, or not, not standard level, but a, a, a new proposal from W3C, the Exchange Working Group on prof, uh, Content Negotiation by Profile, and this is implemented in PyLD API. Uh, so this, uh, this proposal has defines different representations of a resource and these representations conform to profiles. Uh, yeah, so, so part of the evolution of, of using linked data and persistent identifiers at Geoscience Australia is uh, handling the old persistent identifiers. And most of that data has been built uh, with, with uh, a particular use case in mind, which is uh, discovery of data through a web portal. So a lot of the identifiers uh, uh, ha haven't got the entity uh, entity to the entity relationship, or if they do, it's done in a very uh, tightly coupled way with with how the portal works. Uh, so here's an example of uh, discovery uh, of a particular mineral occurrence, which is a site um, that requires a user to to you know discover and browse through the portal, uh, click on on a human readable link and get to that, that GML resource. Uh, there's only a single profile available in this case. Where we're headed to is having content negotiation by profile. So, uh, so the con you can request available context in, in uh, so uh, ask for uh, what profiles are available, what are the formats with those profiles or, or give me all the profiles that are in a particular format um, and then in a uh, more interoperable uh, way, automatically uh, get to the resource that, that, that you want. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so just to sum up a few of the key lessons and chal uh, challenges we've experienced is that it's it's actually uh, quite hard to, to manage persistent identifiers over time and it's really worth worthwhile uh, spending the time in the data modeling phase in the ontology development so that you get the PID identifier scheme right. Um, that uh, when, when you need to remodel and uh, coalesce PIDs that there's quite a bit of uh, standardization work and, and you need the, the appropriate organizational governance. Um, uh, and, and through all of these processes, um, one of the less talked about issues is backwards compatibility of persistent identifiers. So once you move to a new uh, PID scheme, how, how you handle uh, uh, always resolving the previous uh, implemented uh, persistent identifiers. Yeah, well, I think I'll wrap up early. Yeah, thank you. Um, just as a reminder to everyone, um, in the SCED page, there's a link to a Google Doc where we, um, just so we can get everybody um, kind of integrated here, there's a roster for the session. If you'd please go in there and register, that'll be helpful to keep everybody in touch. Um, all right, Ilya, are you online? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Would you like me to run your slides or do you want the screen? Uh, either way, um, whatever is more con convenient. Uh, I, I can run the slides. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Let's okay. see. Um... We are right on time. Thank you so much to all the speakers. I'll go here and make you the presenter. There you are. You should have the screen now. Yeah, if people online too, if you can um, pop into that Google Doc and register. And if you do have questions for people, um, we've been using that as a, a little bit of a question register, and we will use it in the next session. So, all right, um, Ilya, go ahead and take it away. We have your screen. Thank you. Okay, uh, you, you see the first slide, right? Um, so PowerPoint application, yes. Great. Okay, so this is a new project funded by uh, NSF under so-called Open Knowledge Network uh, program. Uh, there's a series of project and it's one of about 20 that is trying to build Open Knowledge Network for uh, domains uh, for, for, for several domains and so also sort out some technical issues. Most of the people here are on the health informatics side and um, there are two like foreign bodies, myself and Joe Hammond who represent uh, geoscientists and the idea is um, to try to look at uh, use cases where um, we, we have um, uh, um, diseases that are caused by environmental factors such as valley fever for example uh, that's been uh, mostly uh, reported in uh, California and Arizona. Um, uh, there are about 149,000 cases um, reported, and uh, the suspicion is that it's a lot of cases are, uh, um, you know, this rate is underreported because uh, um, it's misdiagnosed and uh, it's treated as. Um, it, just a regular uh, uh, flu uh, because symptoms are, are, are similar. Uh, but uh, the issue is that it's a fungal disease and it's caused by uh, a sequence of environmental factors such as you have a radical when fungus grows and uh, um, uh, then you have perhaps uh, drought conditions and windy when people start to inhale uh, the fungus and then uh, and get sick. So based on these factors, you can uh, uh, there are some predictions being built for the spread of valley fever. And uh, this type of work takes an enormous amount of time. Uh, this is actually a, a study from UC Irvine, and it took uh, like several years to assemble the data and do the forecasts. Uh, with knowledge graphs, we're trying to improve on that, and we're not starting from scratch. Uh, there are uh, there's a large body of, uh, um, uh, there's a large registry of uh, health data sets and a system called DataMed. Uh, there are about 2.33 million data set records they have, that, that have been uh, assembled in the system from 75 repositories. Uh, there's a similar 
environment on the data science side, uh, on the geoscience side, where we have 1.6 million records in uh, a system called Data Discovery Studio, and we also work with Pangeo uh, that uh, allows us to um, to deal with very large uh, climate data sets. So imagine a question such as uh, that that could be answerable with um, a knowledge graph. Uh, how we can look at the various uh, number of cases of valley fever and see uh, how it correlates with precipitation levels and we have some environmental conditions and uh, uh, variables such as soils and uh, um, uh, temperature travel and so on. Um, so that type of query can be answered with a knowledge graph and this is what we're trying to build uh, by uh, uh, converting the data sets that we have in DataMet and in uh, Data Discovery Studio into um, uh, uh, knowledge graph representations. Uh, so the, the, the type of query that I'm showing you here is sort of a query template, right? We, we can pose a number of queries that would follow this, this pattern. Um, and uh, we, we are trying to, yeah, I, I must say that the project has been just funded, so I'm not gonna talk much about the results. But we'll talk about the issues and some of the work that we think that we'll do. Uh, just to give you an idea of how these uh, components uh, registries are organized, I'll show you a few uh, slides about Data Discovery Studio. That's a system that uh, we have built for uh, to, to, to help find geoscience data sets across different domains. Um, it's fairly large and come, the data come from about 40 different repositories. Uh, the interesting part of it is that we have a pipeline that uh, um, does text parsing over metadata descriptions and we automatically add uh, keywords to, uh, to metadata with references to ontologies and uh, where, where they came from. So essentially we have uh, a collection of um, named entities for each data set uh, that could be part of the knowledge graph, we just don't have edges yet. Um, then uh, we can certain, uh, sometimes of course, many times I should say, these assignments are incorrect, so there's a way to edit um, the assignments, so there's problem tracing, and uh, if, a few other things that I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. Uh, so the pipeline is organized such that we um, look at keywords um, in multiple ontologies and look for things that we describe materials, processes, equipment, and other things. We also uh, add uh, uh, organization identifiers and uh, uh, if there are place names, we try to add uh, spatial extents here. So you see that uh, whatever has been uh, edited by uh, the, uh, whatever edits have been done by the pipeline can be traced with Provenance link and uh, um, some of the this is uh, enhancement can be rolled back with the functionality. So essentially, what the system does, it goes somewhat beyond just search and allows you to uh, improve and edit metadata, but also integrate with workbench tools and with, with distributed notebooks. So, for example, on this slide, you can see that uh, you can. Uh, uh, launch Jupyter notebooks from any um, uh, from any documents that you find, or from any collection of documents that you find and assemble into a collection, and then do something with that. So uh, it, it works by so, so we, we launch a notebook via URL that includes the document ID in, in the catalog, and then from the notebook we make a call back to. Uh, uh, the registry system to retrieve the entire metadata, figure out what the distributions are, and then retrieve the data and do something with that. Uh, you're very welcome to experiment with that. And so uh, there's also an option to add your own notebooks. So uh, uh, it was interesting to see that um, the, um, on the data map side, uh, side, on the health side, the system was organized quite similarly. They also do uh, um, ontology tagging using the same system that we use called uh, SiteGraph that uh, um, takes a bunch of ontologies and allows you to uh, spit out the documents that will have uh, ontology references added to metadata. 
Yes, and by the way, another thing that we do uh, beyond uh, um, uh, metadata enhancement is everything is published in schema.org, uh, similarly to how it's done on the health side. So at this point, about 900,000 records are uh, um, uh, indexed by Google, and it's been a very slow process. Unfortunately, we've been doing that since April, I guess. So it's uh, eventually we'll get there. Uh, so uh, getting back to uh, the initial question about very fever, how we might want to answer that. Let's say we, we take that query and parse it into um, uh, Intergraph and then split it into subqueries that can be answered on the data math side and the, on the data discovery side. Uh, of course, the, the ontologies that we use to enhance the data on both sides are very different. On uh, data math, we deal with a CBI and uh, gene ontology and snow math. On the data discovery studio, these are Envo and Sweet, KB, DC, and D keywords, and, uh, uh, and similar about 20 different ontologies. So uh, it's not easy to link by that, but we are also trying to um link that by location so for example in this case the query was about california central valley and this is how it comes in the uh, comes out in the uh, 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 parsed query but chances are that uh, when we're trying to look for california central valley on the geoscience side and the, uh, on the data mate side on the, the data net side uh, we will not find exactly these terms. We'll need to do some spatial processing to actually find identifier, uh, find the right geo IDs that we will um, uh, be able to use to link the two data sets, uh, the two collections of, uh, of data sets. And uh, that presented actually a major challenge so far, uh, partly because uh, there are no spatial identifiers on the data map side and the first thing that we've, we've been doing we, we've done is uh, over this break try to run the spatial enhancer that we have on data discovery studio run it on data math records on all 2.4 uh, million records to see how we can join um, uh, the health data with the uh, with geoscience data sets uh, so the book uh, oh. we're, we're just about out of time. So you can yes, yes, and I have just one more slide, uh, which said, which talks about what are the key questions we're trying to answer. Uh, this is how we can build a knowledge network across domains, given that they're very different technologies. How we can uh, uh, do that for collections of data sets rather than from text, and how we federate queries. So we have some initial work on all of, on all of these three questions, and as I said. Um, spatial indexing of data map produced some very interesting results. We have about 600,000 uh, connections between data map and, uh, uh, and, and the geo, uh, which points to some very interesting use cases. And many of them, of course, uh, many of these connections would not make sense, but given a set of templates that would link, that would describe um, uh, respiratory diseases or gastroenterological diseases, then we can try to figure out which of them are useful. And then we're also co-registering uh, DDS and Pangeo. Uh, one thing that we uh, kind of figured out is that just connecting by space would not be sufficient. We are also trying to look at other ways to connect this data by um, uh, population profiles. And things. So, uh, if you have questions, connect uh, with me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, for all the speakers. <laughs>